Significant figures, or sig figs, are a way for scientists to signal how exact their measurements are without having to use statistics. A properly measured value always has its last digit estimated, and so measured values inherently indicate their exactness. But when measurements are used as inputs for calculations, the math can result in far more or fewer digits in the answer. Sig figs tell us where we should round our answers based on the exactness of the measurements involved. Suppose you were asked to measure the length of a line and given the two centimeter rulers shown here. If you used the top ruler, you might estimate that the line was 7.6 centimeters long. The end of the line clearly falls between the markings for 7 centimeters and 8 centimeters, and you would be estimating the tenths place. The bottom ruler, on the other hand, has markings every tenth of a centimeter. Measuring the same line on this ruler, I would estimate the length to be 7.69 centimeters. The end of the line is very close to the 7.7 .7 mark, but it seems just a little short. In each case, I'm reporting the length with one estimated digit. For simple measurements like length, the place value of the estimated digit indicates the type of ruler or scale that I have used. Now imagine that this line is the diameter of a circle, and I want to know the circumference. In order to find that, I would need to multiply the measured length by pi. Since pi is an irrational number, my calculated circumference would have infinite digits regardless of which ruler I use to measure the diameter. By using sig fig, I know where my answer should be rounded in order to indicate which ruler I used to obtain the circumference. Before we can start using and applying sig figs, we need to know how to count them. Since the exactness of our measurement determines the exactness of our answers, we will count the sig figs in every measurement that goes into a calculation. There are just a few rules to remember. Any digit that is not zero will always be significant. Zeros, on the other hand, depend on their locations. I want to be very clear here. Significant is a very specific term, meaning that a digit was measured or estimated. Digits that are not significant are still important. This means that leading zeros, which fall to the left of all non-zero digits, are not significant but cannot be ignored. If I have a number like 0 0.001, it only has one significant figure, but I cannot write that number as a one by itself. The zeros act as placeholders, so that tells me that this number is one thousandth of my unit. Trapped zeros, on the other hand, fall after the first non-zero digit, but before the last non-zero digit. In a number like 101, or 1001, or even a million and one, all of those zeros are trapped. Trapped zeros are always significant. Trailing zeros come after the last non-zero digit. They might represent measured or estimated values, or they might be placeholders. To determine which case is appropriate, we look for a decimal. The location of the decimal doesn't matter, but if the number has a decimal written down, we assume that the trailing zeros are significant. If a number is written without a decimal, we assume that all of our trailing zeros are placeholders and thus not significant. Here are two example numbers. Let's count their sig figs together. In the first number, the first three digits are leading zeros, so they don't count. 5 and 3 both count, and the next 0 is trapped between two numbers, so it is significant. The 1 and the 6 always count. 
The next two zeros are still trapped, and so they are significant, and the four is significant. Our last digit is a trailing zero. So we look for a decimal somewhere in the number. We find it towards the beginning, and so our last zero is significant. This gives us a total of nine sig figs. In our second example, the one, three, six, three, and nine are all significant. That leaves us with four trailing zeros at the end. There is no decimal given in the number. It doesn't come at the end. And so those trailing zeros are not significant. Therefore, this number has five sig figs. Adding a decimal to the end would give this number nine sig figs. And so if you needed to write it with six, seven, or eight sig figs, you would have to use scientific notation. There is a trick that can help when we're counting our sig figs. Since we only use leading zeros as placeholders for numbers that are smaller than one, we'll never be ignoring zeros at both ends of a number. We can strike through zeros until we get to a non-zero digit, and everything that's left then will be significant. For numbers with a decimal, we can start on the left and strike through until we get to a number. That gives us the same nine sig figs that we got before. If we don't have a decimal, then we're gonna start on the right over here and do the same thing. That's gonna give us five sig figs, same as before you're sort of starting at the decimal point to strike through whether the decimal is written out or not. There are, of course, a few exceptions to those rules. We say that these exceptions have infinite sig figs because we're always going to use the smallest number of appropriate sig figs in our answers. Using a number with infinite sig figs means that our answer sig figs only rely on the measured input values. The first exceptions are numbers that are defined. Anytime you're using a metric prefix or any other conversion factor, you can ignore that conversion factor when you're counting your sig figs. Constants are another group of numbers that you can ignore for sig fig purposes. Some of these numbers may be irrational, like pi, or they might be rounded, like the speed of light, which we usually use C for. In either case, treat those numbers as though they have infinite sig figs. The last exception group includes any number that is counted as opposed to measured. All three of these groups contain numbers that are perfectly exact. To use sig figs, we have slightly different rules for multiplication and division compared to addition and subtraction. All mathematical operations will begin by solving the problem without rounding, typically on a calculator. When multiplying or dividing, you're going to count the number of sig figs in your input values and identify the smallest number of sig figs. Then you'll round your answer so that it has that many sig figs. For example, if you were to multiply 153.00 by 0 0.0401 on a calculator, you would get 6.1353 as your answer. 153.00 has five sig figs. The trailing zeros count because there is a decimal. 0 0.0401 has three sig figs. The leading zeros never count, but the trapped zero does. Since three is less than five, your answer should therefore have three sig figs. It's usually helpful to draw a line 
after that three because that tells us where we need to round our answer. The final step is to do just that. Since the last digit is followed by a five, it rounds up and your final answer is 6.14. When adding or subtracting, we're more worried about the location of the last sig fig. Remember that your answer can't be more exact than any of its input values. That means the last digit in your answer cannot be to the right of your largest estimated digit. The easiest way to find this is probably to write all of your input values vertically, as though you were adding by hand, with their decimals aligned. Then, Find the leftmost estimated digit of your input values and draw a line from there down to your answer. The digit identified there will be the last sig fig in your answer and you'll round as needed. As an example, I have this subtraction problem solved for you. The first number, 17.35000, has its estimated digit, that last digit, in the hundred thousandths place. The second number, 0 0.281, has its estimated digit in the thousandths place. Since thousandths are to the left of hundred thousandths, your answer should end at the thousandths place. Your reported answer then would be 17.219. The last thing that I want to mention is that you should only round one time in a given problem. Rounding always increases the uncertainty of a value. And so for multi-step problems, keep as many decimal places as you possibly can until you reach your final answer. Then and only then, look at the sig figs in your input values and round appropriately. The best practice is to let your calculator carry one answer through to the next step. You can usually begin a step by entering an operator. So to add 100 to your previous result, you would just type plus 100. Most scientific and graphing calculators also feature a button that's labeled ANS. You may have to hit the second button to pull it up. The ANS button inserts the previous answer into a new calculation. Either of these methods ensures that no decimals are lost as you move through a series of calculations, even if there are more decimal places than your calculator can display on the screen.